and go. It's, okay, so thanks and welcome once again. Let's see quickly what we did yesterday to try to arrive and put your mindset in academy mode. So, okay. Marta. Reminders, so as you know, we have question and answer session in the morning. Today we have one and it's been the last one if I'm correct, because tomorrow, well, in the, today in the afternoon, we're having the Ministry of Health from Rwanda who will present their implementation in the country. I think it's going to be really interesting because you will see that uh, they have been using Android for COVID. So I think it really applies to what we have been seeing here during the week in the academy. And tomorrow morning, we are going to have at nine, instead of the Q&A session, we're going to have Pamot from Sri Lanka presenting as well their implementation of mobile nutrition. So some statistics. Um, Sorry, yesterday, uh, this is what we saw. Eh? You have been submitting your, your exercises. So we went a bit from program indicators, then we jump into maps and GIS. And lastly, we finished with the aggregate data. And some, yeah, and yes, sorry, I have a different set of slides and I'm getting confused. How okay. come? Uh, am, am I in the wrong place? No, 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 it's just that I, I had hidden something in my, in my sorry. Let's okay. see. So yesterday, as you know, we were having some issues with the server. We really, uh, we're really sorry for that. We apologize. It seems that me, uh, as the responsible of the server, did not set properly the roles. So I'm really sorry, security lesson for me that I will be talking afterwards. But it seems that um, one user, one participant, we know who you are. No, we don't know, but uh, we could check this in the logs. We're not going to do it. Just for you to know, we know it's really hard to administer a server. Maybe we were not clear. We asked you not to touch things you were not supposed to, but maybe you. it's it's hard to uh, remind it or whatever. We are too many administering the server, so it's, it's okay. We just wanted to apologize once again, and we hope it is fixed by now. We should not be experiencing the things that we experienced yesterday. So... But I want to give a, 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 an abstract explanation because this is a very good example for, for you guys. What, what we didn't do, we did not protect the roles. We protected our metadata, we did not protect the roles. And then someone changed the roles so that you all could uh, not, uh, like the protection for the metadata was not, uh, um, Apply. Like applying anymore because the role was not protected. Someone increased the authorities of the role, and then now you all could do everything. So it's very important to protect also the roles. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so sorry again. Yes. Um, so some statistics. So it seems that you are working well. We have a lot of attendance. People are marking their attendance, which is extremely good. But we're seeing that some people are dragging with the exercise submissions. We don't know if this is because you're having issues with the exercises because you don't know how to use the platform. Uh, we're a bit surprised because the numbers are a bit low. So please, please, please come back to us if you need help. The idea is you finish the academy with the, well, with the, grading with the qualification. And for this, you need to submit the exercises. So please do not leave them for the last day. Maybe you're super busy if that's okay, but after the Friday, after tomorrow, we will not be able to help you. So you will be on your own for submitting the things. So please take advantage of today and tomorrow to quickly rush on presenting what you, what you have. Um, now we're gonna show you something super cool because we think that despite all the errors we're having yesterday, this is what we have achieved. And look at this, this is all of you from everywhere in the world. So Marta has login with her user who's like, uh, can access, she's like the super user, so she can see all this. It would be like the data quality or the data checker. And we have people everywhere and for me, the coolest thing, for me, I like the heat map. You're muted, Emata. Eh, One sec. 
to go and I want to explore the whole world before going to the heat map. I hope you can all see yourselves. So look at the sky and say hi. We're there. <laughs> when there is many people, we need to zoom more. We have a lot of people on the screen. <coughs> I think in Nigeria. So this is quite interesting. I think you guys uh, can see yourselves, but because Marta is one, um, it's above. So you can see the whole organization unit tree. She's able to, to see all this. Sri Lanka. Hey, Sri Lanka. I'm a bit worried for this person. You need, yeah. You know, if you need food, we can send you some. Uh, I don't know something. So it seems it's gonna be colder. Heat map. So the heat map was played by Jose yesterday. You can see that uh, it goes from blue to red, and you can see how Nigeria, who conquered the server yesterday, yeah. it's already red when you will look from far away. Abuja. Yeah, less activity in the Americas. Look at Norway, huh? Okay. So I hope uh, we, we fixed we fix the problem. I have been able to enter two tracked entity instance this morning. So if you don't have local data, I would suggest you reset the app and log in again and then try to send your your TIs again and we will have a look at the map tomorrow as well. For now, oh, I, we have 146 tracked entity instances because you are registering more, of course, but um, yeah. Thank you, Martin. We will see. And just to, to, to end with uh, this recap session, this will uh, be seen today. We have not changed the times in general terms, but yesterday we make little adjustments on the times per session. For you, it should not affect you. If you have planned to be here from 10 to 2.30, don't worry, everything's gonna be there. But as I said, we might have to shrink or enlarge a little bit. So if this doesn't map in case you print your session, this is what we're gonna be doing. Today, we're gonna be talking about going mobile with four different sessions from four different perspectives. And there's gonna be a nice surprise kind of at the very end of the last session before we go for the presentation of Rwanda. So I think we can jump straight forward to the first session. I will be sharing my screen. Um, let me go here. Da, 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 da. Opa. Okay, one second. Um, okay. So you should be able to see my screen. So going mobile security implications. So I cannot see the chat now, guys. In case you have questions, please refer to Slack and one of the facilitators will address them to me. I hope you can see the screen well. It's a bit small, but I hope it's enough. Let's see what we're gonna be doing today in this first session. So it's gonna be 30 minutes. Again, we're following the same structure, 30 minutes divided in two, 15 minutes of me talking, 15 minutes of you guys doing the exercises that prove the knowledge and we try to apply what we have been learning. Uh, this session I would like to extend a lot. I think it's really important to talk about security. I think sometimes, and in most of the cases, security is completely uh, look over. Should not be a case. We're gonna be dealing with important data, confidential data, so we're gonna be seeing that. I have divided this session in these four points plus the exercise. I'm going to be quickly talking about what is the CIA, not the one in the United States, but what is the concept in terms of data security, the implications that has going mobile in terms of security, uh, how security is implemented at Android level 
in both our sites and your sites, and uh, you will implement a security policy to apply a security model specific, which is what we'll be doing in the exercise. So, um, I don't know if anyone here knows about security. I love doing this session in a really interactive way where I can talk to you guys and you can ask me questions and we can have a nice dialogue and not a monologue. But if you have already heard about it, it's normal. It's one of the most common things when we talk about data security and it's the CIA triage. Uh, okay, sorry, this is gonna be popping by. So when we talk about CI in terms of data security is these three components here, here called confidentiality, integrity and availability. And I am gonna read it out loud, but I would like you to maybe uh, think before reading the other part, what confidentiality is, what integrity is, and what availability is. I think confidentiality, it's an easier term, maybe the easiest to understand in terms of data security, but when we're talking about data, it's we have information as a concept, and we want usually to transmit or to preserve it, to access data, but let's assume we have data. And when we talk about the confidentiality of the data, we want to know that this data is only accessible by those that was designed to be accessible for. So if I'm telling someone a secret, the secret is confidential because what I'm telling to this person, it's something that I want it to be confidential. I think this word, it's uh, similar in most of languages. So I think you, you understand. So confidentiality, I want the information to be heard or, or to be read or to be interpreted only by those who I wanted to from the beginning. Integrity might be a more difficult concept to understand, but basically it means that we want the information to be authentic, meaning that I want the information to remain in times of term or distance the same way that I was. So on top, of me saying a secret, I want that the person who's receiving the secret, if I'm telling him like this or to her like this in the ear or I'm sending him a private letter, I want that information to be what I wrote and it should not be able, nobody should be able to modify it. And the last thing is availability. And I want the information to be there when I need it. So if I'm writing that secret letter to someone and I'm sending it, this person should be able to access the letter whenever he or she wants. If any of this principle does not comply or is not applied, we have broken what we call the CIA or the security triage. I'm telling you this, I know it might sound a bit abstract, but what I would like you to get from this is that this is the three things that you should be thinking about whenever you are designing a system or whenever you're using a system. Uh, were many participants here and I did not have the chance, unfortunately, to talk to you all. I would like to understand what are you doing on your projects, what are your, uh, what is your position, but as I cannot do it, at least what I can ask you is, so no matter, no matter at what level you are, in your hierarchy, in your company, wherever you are, but you can always analyze your system, in this case DHIS2, from these three aspects. So if you're securing a server, try to see if what you're dealing with complies with this security triad. If you're using the server or the application, try to see if it complies with this. So it would be really interesting that you do an exercise that I'm presenting afterwards, which is this. Last year we did a quiz. I don't have the time to do it now. If you have downloaded the slides, uh, please do not go looking into the last slide because that's the solution. But these are some questions that I would like you to think whenever we finish the session or as an exercise or tomorrow or whenever you want. But these are some things that I think could be thoughts that you could ask yourselves. And I would like you to review the previous slide and reading each of these sentences, see what are the principles that apply here and if I could be implementing this, if I'm checking everything. So for example, I will ask, and I will answer the first question, but it says, your DHIS2 server is down due to a network or electrical issue. 
yesterday, Abdul in the morning uh, was telling us that in Afghanistan, they have uh, acquired a server somewhere in Europe, and sometimes they cannot access the information. So here, if I could be doing this exercise, and I would like to analyze from the security perspective, I would go and say, okay, is confidentiality being broken here, or integrity, or availability? And if I go back before, and I read the definitions of confidentiality, integrity, and availability, I can clearly check the last column, availability. Because as Abdul was explaining, it's like, hey, I want to access my server, and I cannot access my server. So the information probably is there and it's confidential. The, confiden the, the information probably is there and complies with integrity because nobody has modified it. At least we hope this, according to what Abdul was telling us yesterday, we don't know this. But what it's clear is that the availability principle is being broken here. Because when Abdul wants to connect to the server, he cannot connect to the server. So this means that we should take actions to improve this thing. So at one point, we would like to hear not being able to mark anything because we are compliant or to check, but not cross. Okay, I'm leaving you this as an exercise. Whenever you have time, go through it. I think it's really interesting. And again, the last slide has the solution. Uh, if you look at them, it doesn't make sense. So please try to do it and then come back to the last slide to see. I wanted to explain that from your perspective, uh, you might be thinking, okay, DHIS2, I think it's a secure system, and it doesn't really matter if I'm putting Android phones or not. The thing is that because the nature of Android phones, it does really have a huge impact, as I'm seeing here. Um, and this is because, as you know, and I'm seeing here, DHIS2 goes mobile, and so does the data. When you're taking your phone, and you have an Android application installed, the information, and this we will see in the next sessions, information is going with you. You're no longer anymore taking care of only one system as it was before, that is the server. Now you need to make sure that you're securing the server and you're securing all your devices that you have spread in your implementation. This means that uh, if you're dealing with confidential information and you're using phones, that confidential information might be on the phone. So. We're not going to go through this here. We don't have the time, but just for you to understand that putting Android in your projects, it has a really, really, really huge impact on the security, on the data security perspective, from the data security perspective. And this is because, as I'm seeing here, in a web implementation, everything is on the server. Probably if you're users or if you are the project planners, you don't have to take care about this. You say, okay. I'm hiring a company to put the server. I'm expecting them to be professional enough and have all the three triad uh, elements uh, complied with. So we will be having, uh, they will be making backups. They will implement in HTTPS as the the was asking the other day that we will help him with this with this in the community. But from the server side, sorry, I'm having this. I'm gonna I'm gonna mute my Slack. Sorry. So again, from the web server perspective, you might be thinking, okay, the server is safe. So whenever my users are using their, their, their computers to access, I don't have to worry because there's no security implemented on the, on the, on the computer, laptop, whatever. From the DHI super perspective, eh? I'm not gonna jump into other domains from the IT. But the thing is when you add the mobile devices, the data is going with you. So as I said, if you're dealing with HIV patients and you were using the computer, once you were closing the computer, the information had been sent to the server, you didn't have to worry about or less. But now with the phones or the tablets, the information is here. So if I am registering an HIV patient and I don't have uh, connectivity or I do have, but I don't sync or I don't wipe my phone, we are gonna have the information here in case my device is stolen I might have issues, I'm putting patients into risk. Okay. So from the data security perspective, we should care about it, but also because probably you are applied by law. So I don't know the regulation in your countries. I know a little bit about it in Europe, but this is something that we should protect because if not, the law can come against us and we, have, we must pay huge or we can have 
uh, we might pay huge fines because we're not complying with the regulations that are imposed by, by the law. So from us, from the facilitators and from the Android team that you have been seeing these days, we want to tell you that we are taking care quite seriously. Uh, we're taking care of security quite seriously. And we're following for this the principle of OWASP, which is a framework, security framework. I'm putting here the link if you want to open when you download these slides. And I always wanted to mention here that this is the reason that you, for example, cannot take screenshots when you're using the production app. You can, we ensure that the network connectivity is kind of secure, at least from our side. It's up to you then to put the HTTPS, but our connectivity, for example, forbids using deprecated certificates. We are allowing people to encrypt their devices. And if you try to install the Android application in a rooted device, you're gonna get you're gonna get this message here. I don't know if anyone ever tried, but if you are a bit geeky and you have rooted your phone, whenever you try to install the DHS application, you got this. This is because us we're doing our part, or at least we're we're walking towards there, where we keep improving security with every release. But there are things you can do as well. So we have done everything we could, or we're doing everything we can from our side, but then it's up to you to decide how to implement this. And one of the security things that you could do is, for example, in your application, you could set a pin code. And with this pin code, if we go back to the first slide where I was talking about the triage, there we'll be talking about confidentiality and integrity, most of all. Because if I'm blocking my application with the phone, and I know you can probably put a pattern, and most of you here have a pattern in the in the phone or a pin code to access the phone, but because we don't know this, we still build this layer of security on the application. So on the application, you could block your session. So it's not blocking your phone, it's blocking your session. So once you have logged in with your session, you could set a pin code and nobody will be able to access this information if they don't have the pin code. Here, I'm not being really strict because still, if your phone was rooted, someone could access the device, or if your phone was not encrypted, as I'm putting here, they could access, but at least it's a layer of security we have implemented and we're giving you the, the chance to implement. It. So from your perspective of implementers or of designers of the HS2 systems, in case you're gonna be putting Android, maybe you should do a, a, a thinking exercise and say, okay, is my data gonna be taken care of? I'm gonna be dealing with sensitive data, yes, no. If yes, what is the training I should give to my users? What are the policies I should implement? This is one of things, pin codes. And also when you're setting the server, because I told you we are taken care of on our side, but then it's you as implementer or, a, or as a group of people configuring the server, these are things that you can also do that will affect the information that ends up on your Android devices. So for example, here, and this exercise that we suffered yesterday because we were not setting the server properly, but here on the server, one of the things you should do is make sure you're giving the minimal required permissions for that person who's gonna be using the device to work with. So, if a person is going to be capturing data for only one organization unit, as shown here here on the right, so in the Adama, I should make sure that on the server I am putting only that uh, organization unit on the user. Because the moment I give access to more organization units, I am breaking the principle of confidentiality. Even worse, if I combine this thing on the right side, talking about minimal scope, and I give him or her more rights, I'm gonna bring the other principles because this person could, for example, connect to an organization unit in Kakua and could modify the information. So the person who legitimately included or inserted the information in Kakua will find that the information has changed from one, what he put or she put. So have this in mind, there are things to be done on the phone there are things to be done on the server side, but we're trying to improve the level of security as much as we can with the tools we have. 
that's a bit the theory. I know it's been a bit quick over all these things, but I hope it at least gives you a little insight or a little thinking about systems. And now what we're going to be doing is an exercise. So you are supposed to secure your implementation. It's an easy exercise. So this is the introduction. We wanted to put you in the mindset of what's happening. And imagine now that the COVID campaign has finished. So you have been assigned an AC mobile user. And for the sake of reusing the resources and not complica complicating the, the setup of the server, this AC mobile user is not going to longer collect data. So they have gone to the field. They have collected all the information that they needed. This is all the exercises you have been doing in the in the previous days. But now these people, this, this user is not going to answer information anymore. He's only going to be consuming the information. So let's assume these people were spread around the country. Now they're back to their offices. And we would like them to be able to do their reports, but not modify, because the information is already finished. We can assume that. And because we think that they have been collecting sensitive information okay, because we have been collecting patients of COVID and sometimes they can get stigmatized because of this. You have decided as a security implementer that you want also to establish a big code on the application level. So I'm not asking you to put a pin code on the Android device, but on the DHS2 application. So this, as you see here, your task consists on converting the AC mobile into a read only. So you are supposed to go to the server side and modify these permissions. And then you are supposed to go to the mobile and set up a pin code. Like this, you're going to be playing with both sides. So as an implementer deciding to change the permissions on the, on the server, and as an implementer changing the things that can be done on the phone. This is the stars and a little help. But what I'd like you to do is to put the pin code. This I'm not going to give you more clues because I think it's quite obvious. But then what you need to do is going to change the sharing, sharing, the sharing settings of your program. And what I would like you to do is this. If you see on the left side, I am a data encoder. And I can, uh, I can insert data here and put in, for example, the age, 32. On the right side here, I cannot insert data. So I have been transformed to a data read-only uh, user. So what you need to do is submit four screenshots. The first one is you need to change the OU assignment of your AC mobile user. This is already done for you, but we still want to make sure that you know how to do this. So you need to go to your AC mobile user and show us that you know how to reach that step, how to assign the proper organization unit. And there is only one organization you need to sign. We have done it for you, but maybe someone in the system has changed this, unfortunately, because of what I was telling you before of the, with the issue we had. But make sure you have only one organization you need and the one we assigned you in the Excel sheet. Then we need a, a screenshot from your server side as well, where we can see the sharing settings of your program. And then we want to see the screenshot on the phone where we see that the fields are great, so you cannot enter data. Basically, this one here on the right side. And lastly, we would like to see a screenshot of your phone with the print screen, like, oh, what, like, uh, sorry, Opa. like this one. So that's it for now. I think you still have some minutes to do it. Um, it's still 40. We started 45 uh, minutes. So you have 10 minutes to complete the exercise. If you don't have the time, don't worry. You will have time during the day or during the breaks. And you still have time to submit before the end of the, of the academy. So thank you very much. I'm going to go back to Slack. And in case you have questions, feel free to ask there or here in the, in the no, here you cannot. So feel free to ask questions there. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, here we are. Um, for this session, we have a beautiful, nice surprise. Because I'm going to start sharing my screen. Let me go for it. Share screen. 
desktop. So I'm hoping you can see my screen. As you can see, I'm not gonna be here talking alone. We have Milagros as a, an extra facilitator. I think some of you might know her, some of you might not know her. But this session, it's gonna take a bit longer than the other ones we have. And it's gonna be 45 minutes. We have again divided ex theory exercise. But the theory is not going to be me talking for 30 minutes. Uh, thank, uh, thank God somehow, because I'm sure you're going to be tired of listening to my voice the whole day. But it's going to be 15 minutes me and 15 minutes Milagros. And then we will do an exercise of 15 minutes. So this session, it goes about, it is about going mobile configuration. So we have forgotten even though we will never forget about security, but we have been talking about security and now we're gonna be talking about configuration. So here we're gonna see what are the implications of using mobile devices in an implementation from the configuration perspective. We're not talking about security more, but configuration. So what are the things that I need to take care of as a implementer or as a person setting up the server? Um, when I am putting Android devices in my project. Then we will see what is the Android settings web app that if you have been following the community, you might know about it already. This is the part that Milagros will be talking about. And then we, you will have to submit an exercise for evaluation where you will prove that you have understood by set what Milagros explained. Uh, and you will have to set it up or, or well, take the screenshots as we have been usually doing. Um, again, we're saying DHIS2 goes mobile and offline. I think you should know already that the reason what we are having Android devices is that because we want to be able to capture data offline. So this was, I think, one of the main reasons that the Android project was, was created, but it's that sometimes you do not have connectivity to the server. So you are supposed to take information offline in your devices. So if my device is this one here, it's a tablet, I do not have connectivity. It doesn't have a SIM card, it does have Wi-Fi. But when I'm going to collect data on the field, I might not have Wi-Fi and I might not have 3G signal or data signal. So, there are some implications because DHIS2 initially was only being used online. Then this project Android was established. And there are things that you need to understand that it will affect the way you set up your system. So you can use the phones and you can use them as you want them to be used. So we're gonna be covering the offline data into here. We have already talked about data security in the previous session. And here we're gonna be talking about these points here. So what are some things that you might not be aware of, but you should look into when designing a system that works for web and Android devices. So I said, eh? Offline data entry, that's the reason Android was conceived. So you might not have data connection. I mean, in some specific projects you will have, so you will be using the tablets because they are more comfortable probably to, to register data that a phone, that a computer, sorry. But the data, I mean, the, 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 the devices are, are, are designed or they were thought about being able to collect data offline. So in case, because the device will not know if it's gonna have internet connectivity or not. A small break, when I say internet connectivity here, I'm gonna be talking independently about 3G data connections or uh, Wi-Fi, okay? Just to, to make it clear. So internet for me is both. If the, if the computer, if the laptop, if the tablet can reach the server, it has internet connectivity. So let's just simplify that term. So because the tablet will not know if it's gonna have connection to the server or not, what it needs to do is download everything just in case I'm gonna be using. And this everything means 
programs, data set, TIs. So every time you're doing a synchronization to the server, when we ask you, we have been asking you, hey, when you make a modification on the server, make sure you go to settings and you go to sync configuration. This sync configuration, what is actually happened is that your device, your tablet, your phone, your emulator, it's telling the server, listen, give me everything I might need to enter data offline. And with everything can be a lot if I have been set up to be a user that will need to enter data in many organization units, in many programs, or can be as little as possible, that from the security perspective is what we want. But the device will download programs, data sets, and TIs. So it's important to understand, and we will have another session uh, today talking a little bit about this, but it is important to understand that your tablet, it's gonna download, or your device is gonna download as much as they need or they might need. And this is the might, the important thing. So a wrong configuration here can trigger getting too much information, which is gonna make your device slow in the initial synchronization. And it's gonna be slow probably afterwards when, um, when, when operating because it has a lot of uh, information data store. So as I'm seeing here, limiting the scope will impact what is on the phone and how long the metadata meta meta thing will take. Again, if we go back to security, because let's assume we will never forget about security anymore after the lesson or session we had. If I'm putting information on the device and my device gets lost, I have many more, much more information that I should. Let me mute this, sorry. So the device gets as much as they can. And this is, I'm gonna put this a little bit. How can I do this? Oh yeah, okay. So initially, and by default configuration, and Milagros will talk a little bit more about this, but initially what is gonna happen is that whenever your phone or your device connects to the server, it's gonna download 500 TIs and 1,000 events per organization unit. So in these exercises we have been doing this week, you were supposed to be assigned only one organization unit, and that is the reason you were downloading only things attached to your organization unit. And because your TIs did not have much information, the synchronization was quite quickly. But at the beginning, some of you were complaining, hey, but it takes super long time to, to make the synchronization. Well, this was because someone had misconfigured. So you were downloading 500 TIs, 1,000 events for everything for each organization you need to have. On top of that, you're going to be downloading all the metadata associated to that. So if there were 150 programs, because we created 150 programs, and you had access to all of them because of a misconfiguration, you were downloading. On top of the TIs and the events that you're uh, colleagues or your the other uh, attendees had up, uh, uploaded, you were also loading all the information in case you were supposed to update or insert information in any other program. So that could be for the data view and for the data entry, what I'm seeing here is that you download the information you might need and you're gonna reserve. So let me roll back a bit how to explain this. Whenever you're inserting something in the server, the server assigns you a unique identifier. If you have been playing a bit with the API of the, of the server, you know what I'm talking about. If you have not, don't worry. Just assume that everything that goes to the system needs to have a unique value. This unique value, it's something that the server gives you when you ever insert information. So I'm registering a new patient and this patient gets this code, this unique value. The thing is that, again, we're going offline. So my device needs to know that I'm gonna be inserting things in the server. And because it cannot know if I'm gonna be inserting one people or 1000, we assume and we made a compromise and we say, okay, we're gonna assume that one user 
per device will upload likely or at least maximum 100 values. So this means that every time you, you contact the server, the server is going to tell you, okay, just in case you need, I'm going to give you 100 values for you to be able to work offline. And then you give me these 100 values when you have finished. If at one point you don't have enough, I'm sorry, but you will not be able to insert more, more, more tracker entity types, elements, sorry, instances. Uh, but if you have connectivity, don't worry. When you contact me and I see that you don't have many, you can get more. So don't worry. So on that side, from that perspective, you're safe. So if you go to your application and this part of the opa, this part of the exercise, you will have uh, an option, or you have an option to see these reserve values. Again, Milagros will be talking a little bit more about this. But just for you to understand this, when you're going offline, you are downloading everything and you are reserving values to the server. You're saying, hey, just in case I need to get to insert values, give me 100. This is a question that they were asked in the morning about generated IDs, which is linked to this. So if you have been playing or you have been setting a server, might happen that you have decided that you wanted to have a reserve ID or a generated value, let's call it. So for example, when I'm registering a patient, I want this patient to be called A001, and then the next patient is gonna be A002. And if I insert 9,999, the next one will be B001, B002, and so on and so forth. This is what we call auto-generated values. So this is something that when you are setting a data element with this kind of type, with this pattern, the pattern you can play with. I'm putting here an example that I will read out. You're saying, okay, whenever I, I create a tracking entity, uh, when I, whenever I create this tracking entity type with this instance, uh, put this auto-generated value. So for example, in this one here, we have created a pattern that says, give me the three first letters of the organization unit code, give me the current date and give me a sequence. The sequence means that from 000 to whatever. So if, for example, I am creating a patient in Alcalia, CHP, whenever I insert this patient, the system is gonna generate this code for me, ALK, so the three first letters of the organization unit code, plus the current date, years and months, so 11, sorry, 2020, so year, month, 11, uh, little dash. So here, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm missing here a little dash. There's a dash missing here. And then 0, 0, 0, 001, so this equation. Now, if you are awake enough, that I hope you are, and you think about this, and you think about what I have explained before, your brain should start breaking and you say, hey, but what you told me before doesn't make sense because you're telling me that every time, um, the every, when I'm going to take data offline, the server is giving me values, reserve values in advance, like I was saying here. So it's gonna give me reserve, 100 reserve values. But here you're telling me that the system creates this value. So what happens is that Android tells the server, okay, you know what? I have this pattern. I have this pattern and I might enter up to 100 uh, patients. So give me 100 values matching this pattern. So here, for example, if I have simplified the pattern for the sake of the explanation, and the pattern now has become current date, years, month date, and the sequence. And this will most likely not work because what your Android phone is gonna, done, is gonna do today, 26th of November is gonna get these 100 values from, so 2020, 11, 26, uh, tire, I'm missing it here, sorry, I will correct that. 0001 to 2020, 11, 26, 0, 0, If I'm going offline today, so if I'm leaving my house and I don't have connectivity with my tablet, tomorrow, 
when I insert a patient, my patient is going to have the wrong ID. And actually, Android is smart enough to know about this and will say, ah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yesterday, you told me you wanted 100 values and I gave them to you. But the thing is, today is 27 and you want to insert and the value you got, the, the generated pattern is not working anymore. So your phone, your tablet or your device is going to say, mm -mm, your values have expired. I'm sorry, you need to contact the server to get more values. I don't know if this makes sense or not. Anyway, here in the link, you have a quite well explained page where you can see this. And this should make you think that whenever you are designing patterns that might have been working forever in the server side on the Athlon, on the Android, because of this offline concept, it might not work. So here in this website that I'm listing here, we give you some recommendations. And in this case, for example, we'd be not using the date. So it will be the pattern. Use year, month, and the sequence. But then if you are retrieving these values at the end of the month, again, when you start a new month, they will be expired. But at least you have bought yourself this year. A really quick explanation before I, I give the floor to Milagros. I'm not going to be covering here because we do not have the time, but I want you to know that Android allows you to make synchronization by SMS. This means that sometimes you will find devices, not like my tablet that has no SIM card, but you will you might be out there on the field where you have 3G connection, uh, no Wi-Fi, but there will be places where you do not have even 3G connection, but you have GSM connection. So you can send SMS. So just for you to know that there is a way to set up your phones. Of course, it requires some setup at the server level, but you could synchronize your phones with SMS. This is not something new. I know that the previous applications were doing this, the, the data capture, I think, or I don't know the names. Again, it requires configuration on the server. And your phone will set up and will sync instead of by, by internet, it will compress everything in SMS, it will send to the server and will do it. If you use the application that is on Google Play, this is not working. And this is because we're, we're having an issue with Google in the sense that they think that in order now to submit applications that can use SMS functionality, you need to pass a specific requirement that we're still working on it. So in the future, we expect the application uh, that is on Google Play to have this capability, but now it is not. So it's the one that you will find in GitHub. Again, more information on this topic down here. Now I've been talking for 15 minutes, 16 actually. I'm going to give the floor to Milagros. Milagros, welcome. I don't know if you want me to be sharing the slides or you want to do it. I think you can unmute yourself. So please talk to me. Uh, hi, Jose. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, if you, if you win, I, I, can, I can share my screen. But... Okay. I think you should be able to do it. Uh, you should be able, no, right? Can you, can you? Okay, give me a second. I'm always... Absolutely. Yeah, at least continue with the recording. So thank you, first of all, Milagros, very much for being here. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much. Again, hey, hi, everyone. I hope you are enjoying uh, our academy. I'm Milagra Rodriguez, I'm Peruvian, part of the Android team. I'm a front-end developer and uh, I was in charge of developing the Android settings web app. So hope you keep enjoying our presentation and let's start. So what is the Android settings web app? Uh, the Android settings web app, it's a web app that allows us make the configurations for the data and metadata such as define the, uh, when we want to synchronize it, run some Milagros. tests for you, sir. Milagros, sorry, I think you are not showing because we're seeing only not the presentation. Eh? So you were seeing oh, the presentation, sorry. but I think you click on present, but maybe another window came. So really? I think you want to be already on the first slide, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're um, only seeing... So if you click on present, so you so speak. Hello, hello. Okay. Uh, okay, but it says 
that I'm sharing. But can you click on present? Upright. No, I mean, I mean the presentation upright. Mm. Uh, I think the thing is we're, see, we're, we're, we're seeing now yeah, your, your Google. Yeah. So I'm saying the, the, the present button that is close to the share button in the right, up right. Mm. So we're in the right, right, right. Move them out to the right, right. Right. More right. The thing is, right. I think you 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 have one screen on top of the other one. So go right, go right, keep going right. Do you see full screen or you don't? Because we don't see full screen, and I think you're seeing full screen. Okay. Uh... I have mute also video security participants. Sorry, you share pulse share, remote control, and okay. No, but Amazon if you go Amazon. there, there. So uh, if you click on present, but we want you to present the yeah. Stop. Can you stop sharing? So participant suggestion. Okay. Yeah, I'm Look, so sorry. The thing is, uh, I'm gonna sh show you because I think I, at one point you click and we didn't see. So you were here, but. So here, up here, present. Mm -hmm. We were not seeing. We were not seeing that screen. We were oh. seeing only the small one. So if you oh, can so click sorry. here, because if not, that's a move. Yeah, all yours. Sorry. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Give me a second. Okay. Now I'm sharing here, present, it's now showing. No, Is it showing no. now? No? no. But I click on present. Uh, maybe it will be better if you help me. I'm not okay, sure yes, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna share the slides, okay? I'm gonna share the slides and yeah. whenever you want next, you tell me next and I will I will be doing that. Okay, maybe. The, Maybe yeah. better like that. Let me go. Okay. Okay. Just but we can go back. So, so as I was saying, and the settings up, uh, it's a web app that allows us to create configurations, define the data, metadata that the Android app will synchronize on the device. In addition to that, we can run some tests of the size of the data we want to synchronize per user. And all the configurations that we are creating will be safe in the data store. Data store is a storage space that allows us uh, to save and access data in JSON format. Uh, next, please. Okay, uh, currently only users with all authority are able to define uh, these configurations parameters. So we have a small chart here. Can we go up? Uh, and we said that first, what we can do if we have a user with all authority, we can do a first time setup. So this means that we can save all the um, default values at the beginning. And then we have also general, we, we are able to edit and save general settings, program settings, data sets, and run the user screen tests. But if you are a user with, no, with not all this, config, uh, all this authority, you cannot be able to, to do these three, uh, sorry, four options, the previous four options, but you will have access uh, to the web app in a read-only mode. And uh, you, you can be able to run uh, the user screen test. Uh, the web app has four sections, and three of them are configuration, and the last one is uh, the user, the uh, run the user sync test. So now let's start with program settings. Uh, sorry, general settings. General settings is the first section, and it includes configurations such as how often we want to synchronize metadata, data, the phone number, reserve values we want to download per track identity instance at attributes and the options to encrypt or not the device database. Uh, let's be clear about this option. Uh, it's a critical action, but also uh, what it's important to remember is that it's 
it will only affect the device uh, database and will not affect at all your DHIS2 database. So it's two things. Then we have uh, disable all settings. This is our uh, last option in this section. And if you click this button, uh, what you will be able to do is to remove, erase, or disable all your, all your settings, which means you will remove everything uh, from general programs and data set settings. So always be careful when you are, if you decide to click this. So our next section is program. Programs uh, is a, has two parts. As you can see, we have a, a title that says global and the other one is specific. So what means global is that everything that we create here, all the configurations that we create here are going to be applied to all the programs that the user has access to. And these settings could be, for example, the maximum tracked NTP instance or events that we want to download, the um, how often, like the, the update period. And also we have a setting level. This setting level means if we want to create these configurations per uh, program, per or unit, or both, per program or, per or unit. So uh, this is the level of configuration we want to create. But what happens if we don't want to, uh, if we want to add a configuration specific for a child program, for, um, that it's kind of different from the global one. So that's the reason we have the second section. And um, it's a specific uh, program, a specific download sync settings. So what we are going to do here is that we have an add button. We click there, uh, a list of programs will be up, will appear. And after we click in on a program, um, it will show a settings taking into account the program type. What means program type? It means if it's with or without registration. Um, and then we uh, after we add programs, uh, uh, specific settings to a program, um, a list of these programs will be appeared here. So now let's move on to data sets. Data sets, it's pretty similar to the previous section. So we have also two, two sections. One is related to global and the, one, and the other one is a specific. So data sets, uh, the global data sets uh, also will, will mean that whatever we want to apply here, or here the, the configuration, that the setting that we can apply here is the number of periods to download. So if we add or we change the, this number, it will apply to all the data sets that we have access. And if we don't want uh, that we want to create a specific configuration for a data set, we can go to the second part. And this is the add button. We click on that on there. Uh, dialog will pop up with a list of the data set. Don't worry, I will show you later in a demo how to do it. So uh, then this data set, you choose the data set that you want to give a configuration and uh, it will also complete with um, a default value based on the period type. Period types could be uh, quarterly, monthly, weekly, yearly. Uh, you, you previously have decided what kind of period type your data sets will be. Um, so now that we've already create configurations. We decided what we want for our data sets, our programs, and in general, what we want to do. Um, we can start testing if our parameters are good or make sense for what we're aiming for. So that's the reason we have this last part that is user scene test. So user scene test is an option that give us the opportunity to check the amount of data a user will synchronize on their device. So one thing that is very cool about this part is that we can not only run this test on the user that is currently 
login, but also in other users. So uh, our, we can see here is that our tests uh, will show us things like our units that we are we have access to, uh, then data sets, programs, program rules linked to an org unit, and the metadata and data download size. So um, don't worry, I will show you later a little more about this. And if you find it that, okay, uh, it's cool this information, but I want to try it, I want to uh, to see, uh, to try with try myself if this how it's working, so we can install it. Uh, these are some steps of how to do it. First, we need to go to app management. Then you will find a sidebar and a section that says app hub or app store. Click on there. You will find a a list of all the apps we have we can download or we can install it. So try to scroll down till you find the Android settings app, click on install, and that's it. So it's uh, very simple. Uh, if you want to check that the app has been installed, just go to standard apps on the sidebar and you will find it there listed. So that's it. This is our web app. I hope you, you find it interesting. So now I'm going to go to uh, to show you a small demo of how to do it and how to interact with our web app. So just give me a second. I'm going to present now. Milagros, you, you will share your screen, right? Yeah, yeah I'm going to share my screen okay. now. Thanks. Am I sharing now? It's OK? Yes, yes, now it's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. This is right. So this is how uh, how it looks our Android settings web app. Uh, as I told you before, if you have an, an a user with all authorities, you'll be able to start the config uh, to set up the first um, um, the first default values. And you'll be able to edit and save. Um, so in this case, I, I have this kind of user. I'm gonna, and this is how you, you it will look the first time you are start uh, you are start using the the web app. So I'm gonna click here, set default and save. When I'm I'm clicking here, all the default values will be saved in the data store. And now uh, we can start. We have our four sections general programs data sets and the user exchange test. Um, well, we can, this, this is how I was, uh, this is what I was uh, talking before. So we can change the, how often we want to think. Maybe I want to add a ISMS number. Mm. Try to, to, to be sure that the information that you are entering here is something that you are really, uh, that it's uh, related with what you want to do. And now I'm just giving uh, numbers that are not real, but it's, uh, if you want to do it, please just try to think before what is your plan. Uh, I'm gonna say that I want to encrypt the database. Uh, so I'm going to encrypt here. And only after I click save, the all the information will be uh, saved and in the data store and you'll be able to, to, to look at this in your device. So I'm going to click save here. Now I'm going to programs. Programs, as I said, our two options. I want program unit. I'm going to add a program as I'm, I'm choosing case events. Uh, maybe I want per unit and I want maybe less event to download. I'm saving. I want also COVID area, but as you can see here, these options are kind of different from the previous one. This is because as 
I said before, the options that we present uh, per program is related to the kind of program type it, it is. So when it's for some options are for programs with registration and some other for that are, uh, other options are for without registration programs. So I'm saving a little bit here. And as you can see as well, here there's a list of the programs that I'm adding a specific settings. Also here, the summary of, the, of what I've already created, the, the parameters that I added. And if I want to edit or delete this specific row or the specific program setting. So I can edit here. Now I will not be able to change um, the, the program, but I can be able to change uh, other parameters. I will save it here. Maybe delete this one. Um, I will save it. It's important to always save it before leaving the section. Data set, we only have uh, access uh, to change here the number of periods to download. So I want more data sets. Here I only have two data sets. One here, um, and as I told you before, it will auto complete with a value that it's by default related to the period type. Um, I will save it here. I will also add this one that is plus for a weekly period. And as I was saying before, it's important to always save. But what happens if I'm leaving this section without saving? Uh, this alert will, will pop up. So it says that if you try to leave this, uh, this section, you will lose all your changes. So in this case, I don't want to lose my changes. So I will click. Oh, sorry, I lost my changes. It was canceled, so I will just add one again. This one, um, now I will save, sorry. So basically, I've, I already uh, created some configurations for my devices. I added general program data sets. So I can test now, mm, as you can see, my user is Milagro Rodriguez, but as I was saying before, you can not only test with your user, you can also test with other users. So I will try to test with another user, in this case, and Andres Miguel. I will click here. And while it's running this test, um, you can see that I can have, I will have information such as all units, data sets, programs, program rules. And these are um, some values that we recommend as maximum values. So it's not running, it's taking some time to, to run all our tests. And that's it. So uh, we have some values. Here are some values that are highlighted in red. This means that uh, alert, these numbers are greater than our recommended maximum values. So here it's way more greater than, than our uh, maximum value. But it's a good way to know, okay, our configurations are good for what we want. Uh, it's going to perform well. Uh, what will happen if I, um, if I am having this kind of numbers, should I change something to make it uh, not suffer our device? So our device not suffer, what should we do? So this is a good way to test. So I hope you enjoy and you find it helpful. And I think this is everything coming from the Android settings web app. I'm not sure if you have any questions or something that you want um, to know, but this is our web I hope you, you can use it and find it helpful, as I said. Thank you for your time, and this is, this is it from me. Thank you, Milagros. Thank you very much. Um, if this is there any questions, feel free to put them in Slack, and Milagros is going to be there answering your questions. Uh, let's jump quickly to the exercise where you will prove um, 
the knowledge you have acquired from Milagros' presentation and from my previous one. So Milagros, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna share my screen. Yeah, thank you very much. So in this uh, going mobile configuration sessions, we are gonna have this exercise. So this is the kind of setup. So after all the tests, so you have been doing some tests. Marta will explain this a bit later in her session. But let's assume you have accepted that you want to have Android devices in your DHS2 implementation. So you have to work both on the server side and on the mobile side, on the side, sorry, that's a side. Um, so you want to make sure that your server side is properly configured and that your Android is properly configured. So you need to make sure that the mobile before going to the data capture trip, you need to make sure he has or the device has enough values. So that's where you will check that the Android settings web app is correct for your for your program, and you will refill your Android device with enough reserve T values. As I was telling you before, before going on when synchronizing, the device gets everything it might need, and if you enter values, these values will. Your task, it's verify the Android settings web app and insert several TIs. So here, if you see on the left here, I have 99 reserve values. This means that I have inserted one TI, but I can come to the refill and I could tell the server, listen, I'm going on my field trip, give me as many as I might need. Again, the default value is 100, so I'm gonna get 100. So if I click the refill, the server will give me this. So your task is verifying this and sending a screenshot as I will show later and doing a refill. There is an asterisk here because the Android settings web app, you are not gonna be able to modify it. And the reason you will not be able to modify it is because if the 75 people of you who are here modify it, it will lead to an inconsistency because only the last person who writes will, uh, those changes will be pushed to the server, will be saved. So this, I advise you or I encourage you to test on your servers, testing servers, of course. Uh, and here you can still do the, the viewing so you can verify that your settings are correct. So we're asking you three screenshots. The first one is that we, you prove that you know how to find the Android web settings app and you can show us your program on the screenshot in case there are too many. Um, we want you to show us the TI refill values before refilling so that you have inserted one TI so this value has decreased and then that after pressing the refill, this value goes back to the max number. That's all, thank you very much. You have some minutes to do the exercise before the break. Sorry, we extend a bit more. Um, I think if I'm not. So we'll be back at 45, I think, yeah. So in seven minutes, so we're taking the break, but if you wanna work on the exercise, I'm gonna be here taking questions if you need. I think Milagro is, is also gonna be there and Martin and Jose are also present. So feel free to go to the Slack channel and present your questions. Thank you very much.
so people is asking that um, they cannot how they can select a program and entering data there and it's you cannot okay you cannot because uh, uh, as milagro said uh, this only works for users that has uh, the all authority and uh, you don't have that authority so this is this app is supposed to be used for the just the super admins of the system and but what you can do is just to 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 read the values that are already there okay but you cannot modify or edit any value Analysis, someone can make Marta co-host. Yes, sure. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Jose Milagros, uh, we have some questions in the channels. So, Sergio, for instance, is saying um, he's seeing the message that you don't have authority to set up the Android settings to this instance. So I told him he doesn't have the old permission in the server, but then he says, I'm missing something because I cannot even see the settings. I'm not able to pass through the first time setup screen. So he feels he cannot do the exercises. Uh, if he try, if he reloads and try again, because now there should be data the stored in data stored. So. Okay, to. so please reload. And then we have Mike in announcements also saying, I tried setting up the Android settings web app in our server. However, it prompted me for a username and password. I tried using my credentials, but it didn't let. So this is your own server. It's not uh, the Android server, Academy server. So I imagine, do you have all permission in this uh, server, Mike? I'm gonna type it here in case. have a question for Milagros. What is the logic of having a separate section? This is from Abdul. A separate section for user sync test. If we can show instant error or alert message in the sections where we put the values. You want to answer to that, Milagros? Maybe Milagros took a break because he just finished, but I think Abdul, we need to we need to make um, a simulation with all your configuration because the values that you put in one specific pro program maybe are okay uh, if we don't mix them with the others. So the simulation for your user is combining all the configuration for your programs, data sets, and that's a separate process that is run in the end when you finish your your configuration, I don't have a better answer for that. It's just something we cannot be triggering with every single configuration. So Deepika says, I cannot specify my program as the access is not provided. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, yeah, you cannot you cannot open your program because the, the yeah, you, you are not able to modify anything in the in the Android settings app. You only can view. So everyone can only see. Right? Yes. So you, you are supposed to you can run the test in the in the section of the testing or in the testing section when you are like entering a username and then you can it will like show up the the number of our units, the number of the size of the metadata data that is loaded, etc. But you cannot the rest of the application you only have few permissions. So in the exercise you were asked to verify your settings. As Milagros, was explaining, as Milagros was explaining, this is like a hierarchy thing. So if you do not have a specific settings for your program, then the general ones are going to be applied. But, but if you want to make sure that the defaults, you, what you can do is you can put, as Jose is saying, you can go to the tests of the user. You can put your mobile user, not the admin, and tell us what would happen. So any, any screenshot of those two would be valid because you're saying, okay, they're not specific for my program. 
So I'm using the generic ones, or I can make a test and I will see that uh, in this test of the user, I'm downloading these specific things. So it's normal that they see the things grayed out because of the permissions. Yes. Okay. So we had the... George, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to follow. George Maguire saying, not able to see. Uh, grayed out. So George, it's it's is is the permission thing or is something else you are not able to see? How to refill the numbers? Uh, you refill from the device, no? You you refill from the Android app. You set in the set in the web app. You set the the number of values that you want your device to be pre-saving. But the refill you you make it in the Android app. Submit a screenshot of the Android web settings app for your program. What can I do? Maybe the wording, Jaime, for Milagros. Yes, maybe I should have changed the wording of that. Uh, I thought that with the explanation here it could be enough, but I'm gonna change the yes. slides and I'm gonna re-upload the slides to the there for those that cannot attend on live session. Yes, and uh, maybe we have to change the submission as well. Okay, but please, uh, Chamika, I have replied to you. Um, what we expect you is if there's no specific for your program, this means that there's no for your program. So you are gonna be applying the ones inherited from the general settings. Okay, uh, I'm gonna take this other question because maybe it was not clear. And I will do the, okay, thanks Chamika. Uh, Deepika is asking, she says, I cannot refill the Android app. Okay, I'm gonna go back to my slides and I'm gonna show you. Uh, let me present the screen. So, we go, we go, yes. Okay, share screen. Okay, so here, I'm telling you, exercise task, insert several TIs, verify that the reserve values decrease, these are decrease, and refill those values. So of course, if you already have 100 values, your device has already contacted the server initially and has said, give, give me as many as that might, and I always will say might need. So the server, because of the default configuration, provided a hundred values to the device. Now the device, if you click on refill, you will do refill, but the server will say, hey, I gave you 100 and you have not used, not even one of those 100. So what do you want to refill? So if my, you know, my car is, the gas is full and I try to put more gas, it's gonna be full already. So I cannot put more gas. But if I consume some of those values, I will be able to refill. In order to consume those values, what I'm putting here is insert several TIs. Actually, what would be nice if, if you put, if you insert one TI, you go there, you, should, you will see that the value becomes 99. If you put another TI, it will become 98. And then when you click refill, you will see how this book becomes 100 again. I hope I, I answer your question, Dipia. Uh, some of you, so, so because I think, uh, yes, okay, it doesn't matter. It, it depends on when did you sync with the server. Yesterday, there was a different configuration as from now. As long as you provide one screenshot that shows that you have less values, and then when you click refill, there are more values, it proves that you have understood the concept and you can refill the values. So in my program, for example, I have 200 because yesterday when I sing, the settings were 200 
I think some people now are saying that they have 80. It's okay. Just insert some values and go there and see how this decreases. So it's actually three steps, but two screenshots. First check, insert TIs, check how it reduces and refill. Thanks, Mario. Jaime, I think uh, the shared the screenshot showing he can see a lot of uh, reserved values. Did you address that? Uh, no, but there, I guess that, I mean, this is probably from the wrong configuration from yesterday, but I don't know what one is your student number. Mm. I guess it's 29, because actually, if you see. No, well, it's 51. not It's not from yesterday. I just logged in and I still see a lot. Um, well, in, in this specific case, in the screenshot from the Rebe, I can see that in many of them, you have zero reserve values. This is because you have not access to write on those organization units. We should verify if there is a misconfiguration. But if your program is the 21, to, sorry, the 29 or the 51, you will see that you should be able to add and indeed decrease those values. I guess you are 29, that's my guess, because you have already decreased that from one for 200 probably to 197. Yeah, yes, you see, so you're 29. So this means you have three TIs and you have not performed a refill. If you could go to that screen that you're showing and click on refill, you will see that it comes back to, to 200. So if you see more, just ignore them. Focus on the one from your program with your student number. Uh, guys, I have several people asking me in private. Uh, I'm sorry, I cannot address all the all the things you're telling me in private. I have too many messages. Uh, please make sure you put them in the general channel because we have many more facilitators there that will be able to help. Uh, when I'm giving the training, I'm giving there. Now it's going Marta, so I will jump to the channel. But whenever I'm I'm, I'm giving the support the um, the session. If you take advantage that there is a channel where there are other facilitators, there you will get your answer much faster. And if you see that we cannot, we're not replying, please ping us because there is a huge stream of messages. So say Jose, Marta, Jaime, Milagros, Victor, Pablo, and then we will see the question. Uh, we still have questions like, I see reserve values is set to 80, not 100. For BLESS, for Deepika, it says 199. As Jaime said, just prove that you enter one TEI and the number decreases, and then you refill and the number increases. It's okay if the number is 80 or the number is 100. We just need to see that it decreases and, and, uh, and increases when you enter a, a patient. Like mine now says 80. So I can register a TEI, it will say 79. And then if I refill, it will say 80 again. So it is sometimes a bit confusing because we are all touching the server like my device was synced, it said 80, 
Now I enter one and now it says 159. So probably it's not being updated, but now when I refill, it keeps saying 159. Guys, I think we need to check what's going on. I'm gonna think again. <laughs> I can. I mean, I did the exercise yesterday. I think the problem is that we have wiped the configuration from the web settings app. So, mm -hmm. did you think before? I did, but I'm thinking now as well. I just looked in. Uh, also, what can happen, and this, I don't know how it works. The thing is that for you guys to understand, yesterday there was an Android web settings app that has been wiped out. So, now with the new settings, I'm not sure that the ones you had, so imagine here in the one from yesterday for the program 29, I had something specific. In the new one, this is not present anymore. I don't think my device is gonna receive anything because if 29 is not there, so I'm gonna use the, the previous one. What you could do in this case is reset your app. So it's like clear completely out, perform a uh, login and you will have the new values for everything. I'm going to do that. Uh, meanwhile, I think I can say that I was checking, we had a request for a flag on day two, and then uh, it was posted, I think it was Peter, but maybe I'm wrong, sorry, or Patrick, uh, and, uh, and then I followed up, it was posted in the community, thank you, I followed up with the team, and in 235, all flags in the world were added, and they were backported to the previous versions, but to the last uh, patch version. So in the version we are using, we don't have the flag. In this case, it was for Dominica. But if you go to the last demo server, 235, you can find it there already. So just for all of you to know that from probably October, all last versions of the HIS2 have all flags in the world available. Now, if it's an NGO or an organization that needs a logo, that needs to be requested. And I keep logging in. <coughs> Sorry. So Robert is telling us that the window is grayed out. So Robert, as Milagros is saying, that's correct. You just need to explore. You don't have permissions to change. Marta, feel free to start whenever you feel like it. Okay. Let me try the exercise. So, 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 where am I? Have we reminded today to everyone to mark their attendance? Uh, we haven't actually. I <laughs> thought it was quite clear. 
from from all the messages please the attendance please the feedback and i'm sorry i forgot i realized that i forgot to mention the feedback from yesterday uh in the recap session i completely mm -hmm. oversaw it i'm really sorry we have received the feedback we really appreciate uh tomorrow we will we will talk about it uh, thank you very much sorry that i i forgot but it is uh it's been received Okay, I am. I'm gonna start, uh, but for for you guys to to if you want to research or investigate while I am presenting uh, facilitators, I think I got eighty. I didn't enter anything. I refill and I have hundred. So we can have a look. I'm updating the sessions, guys, with your suggestions are the mistakes I made. So it is clear on the sessions for those that are attending offline. So. OK, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, is it Alice or, or Martin, if you want to resume the um, recording? Uh, it doesn't even post, actually. Okay, then. <laughs> Go somewhere, please. Then I can start. Oops, oops, oops. I want to silent uh, notifications. Okay. Okay, so um, hello everyone again. We are starting the third session of the day. Uh, Jaime, please remind me until what time do I have? Because we have started late, right? You have until 12.10. What? <laughs> okay, really? Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. No, but I, I mean, the thing is that we were, we were five minutes uh, in this and we didn't give enough time for the exercise. So feel free it's to okay. take till... I'm going to adjust, yes, but um, yeah, okay. So, um, so this presentation is about the, your implementation. It's about your project. It has two sections. It had one about the life cycle of the project and then uh, one that goes more specifically in one of the sections of the phases of the project, which is the testing. So probably I'm going to reduce that second one, but I'm going to leave all the slides there so that you can have it as a materials or as uh, information for you. In any case, I will still go to the key messages. So don't worry about that. This is, um, these are the six phases in which we have conceptualized an implementation project. Uh, this and any, everything that I'm gonna say in this presentation is not set in stone. It's not a magic formula that works for any project. We are working with generic assumptions and generic recommendations, but everything depends on the project, the size, the setting, the team, the budget. So just take things as generic recommendations. So we are gonna focus first on this part, the server configuration, internal testing, user acceptance test, and field testing. So all this is your testing, <laughs> is your configuration and testing. And why are we focusing on this? Because these phases, all of them inform or modify your configuration. Your configuration should be flexible till this point. Uh, afterwards, I would recommend to keep it more like, closed and unstable. Uh, so this, uh, these different phases of testing that we are going to talk about, ideally, they are cycles. And, and they inform your, your server configuration, you test, they inform. And the cycles keep growing right? as the testing grows as well. So we are not going to be making a pilot, a field testing every week, and then updating the server. So obviously, the cycles grow your internal testing, you might be testing and, and configuring during the same week. 
uh, 10 times, but your user acceptance test, the cycle is going to be bigger. And for the field testing, the cycle is going to be bigger. But you need to be ready and willing to keep adjusting your server to whatever you find out in these phases. So this is generic on the HIS2. When you design and configure the HIS2, most of you are experts in the HIS2 already. So you know that you need to be thinking of what do you want to get out of the system when you configure your data entry. You need to be thinking of how it's, this is going to be analyzed so that I'm picking the right information. Uh, you also need to be thinking how is your data collection flow uh, in, the, in the field. And now, because of the Android app, you are also, as you learned on day two, or three, two, two, uh, you also have to pay attention to the visual configuration and the user experience. Another general recommendation, which is not mobile or anything, and is very minimum, uh, you, most of you know already, and um, sometimes I feel a bit uh, strange making this presentation for experts because you know these things, so sorry if this sounds redundant to you. But, uh, but for those that need a reminder, <laughs> we usually recommend everyone, the world usually recommends having three servers. So you need one where you play, you test, you explore, you experiment. And that has to be different from your production server. You know this, this is for many reasons. One, that you have to be, you need to, to be able to, 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 to play, to change. It has to be flexible, but also the protection. Your production server is going to have real data. So security really makes a difference there. And then your training server needs to be different so that your users can play, can enter dummy data, can explore and, and, and break as much as they can. So that's the minimum we recommend uh, for, a, for a real project. Now, about the server configuration, I'm not going to extend the, the explanation here. Jaime has been explaining a lot uh, that we need to restrict, that we need to be aware that we have a mobile user. Everything has to be adapted. And I think, please keep in mind this picture, this, the, the right side of the, of, the, of the slide when you, when you configure your mobile users. You are going to be running all your program rules, storing all your data, the logic of tracker, the sharing settings, everything in a tiny device compared to the resources of a server. So please keep that in mind and make your configuration as simple as possible your life will be easier later. <laughs> so let's uh, go to each one of the phases of the testing. We are going to leave these materials for you. I really liked all this the first time I saw it because it helped me organize what was I doing on each phase. So internal testing, what are you testing in the internal testing? You are testing your configuration. And in the case of mobile, you are also testing the Android app and how it responds to your configuration. You are looking for errors in your program rules, in the data entry form, in the visual configuration, if it looks as you expected or if you, as you configured. You are looking for bugs because the earlier you report them, the, the most chances you have to get them fixed before you go to production. And you are also identifying improvements and new requirements uh, that you can suggest. Uh, to, and we hope you suggest to, to the HIS2 so that the roadmap can keep being informed from real projects. So how to do this? Uh, methods and periods for testing vary from group to group, but it has to be iterative, it has to be flexible, done in the early, early, early phases and by a small group of people, sometimes the same group of people that is configuring the server. It has to be flexible. And your best friend during this phase is the documentation. Because the documentation is going to tell you what to expect, what is a bug, what is supported, what is not supported, and it will allow you, it will save you from wasting time trying to understand why something doesn't work. So please remember, especially in the case of the Android app, have the configuration available, uh, available and, and, and open uh, as much as you can. Uh, now, the next phase, once you are happy with your configuration, with your testers' internal team, then you can expose it to the users in the first phase called user acceptance test. These, thing, these names are also not like, these phases have different names. The important thing is what you do. So what you do here, you're testing your system configuration, the input and the output. 
that is what the users actually expect, but you are also testing the usability, the user experience. You need to, you want to see how they receive it. You need to see how well they follow what you thought they would be following in the data entry flow. If they know what to do uh, in each stage, if they need to make many questions, is it intuitive, is it not? So you are testing how your users behave with the app and how the app feels for them. And you are looking for adjustments. They are gonna make comments on the wording. They are gonna make comments on this field, this other field. Identifying champions. Your champions for the next phases, for the training, for the deployment, for... So you can keep an eye on your really smart users, the ones that pick things fast, the ones that have very interesting questions or point out things that you missed. How to do this? A control environment, short exposure to, to the technology, to the user, so you are not deploying it in the, in the real uh, work day. You, you call them, you stop them, they are just doing this. It's a short exposure in a controlled environment, and it's not necessarily integrated with their daily work practices. Again, not magic formula, do it as, as you think is better for your project. This is just a recommendation. And then once you're happy with your configuration after your internal, after the user acceptance test, then you can go to the field testing or pilot. What are you testing here? You are testing that your solution, how it integrates with the SOPs and the workflows of the day-to-day -day work of your health workers or any worker, field worker. You are testing your infrastructure, you are testing the architecture proposed, you are testing your training materials and procedures because you are going to train this, ideally, this, uh, this, this group of people. So you are again looking for adjustments, but you are kind of already evaluating your solution. You want to see if the decisions you made until this point were uh, adequate and, uh, and you, are keep, you are also going to identify champions here for your global deployment or rollout. How to do this? Again, this is not a magic formula. So, <laughs> sorry, I keep saying this, but it's, it's, it's really true. But generally, you can target 20 or 30 users, minimum of two months, so that you see the real acceptance. And you need to decide where to go, where to, where to test um, your app. Uh, my suggestion, this is what I do. Don't choose the easiest place. But don't also don't choose the most complex. Don't, don't, don't challenge yourself too much. Try to find a middle point. Don't go to the ideal scenario, but don't go to the worst one because you really want to see if your solution, unless your target is the worst one. <laughs> you really want to see if the solution is okay. So don't, don't, yeah, so I think it's clear. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to be fast. And then considerations, define before going, what are you going to be looking at after? But how are you going to evaluate this and, and decide your strategies on pilots? If it's a very critical environment, you may want to replace the current solution. I think it's a bit risky, but sometimes you need it or you put it in parallel, but now your workers are going to have double work and then it's not a real scenario. So I'm not saying what to do. It really depends, but these are things that you need to consider in advance. And then the, the scale up. Um, so you need to decide. Now we are going to think of, we are going to talk mainly about the devices uh, and the acquisition of devices. So you need to decide which kind of device you are going to use. Is it a phone, a tablet, a Chromebook? It will depend. Now I'm thinking of mobile. Huh? You can also use a desktop, but thinking of mobile. It depends on your user, what activity is the user going to be doing and where. Is it mobile? Is it going here and there? Is it a community health worker? Is it a facility officer sitting on a table? This will help you pay the large scale acquisition. Don't start the project buying a thousand devices. You can split the acquisition in time. And at the very early beginning, you can test a few models and see which one adapts better uh, to, to your use case. So this is just an example that I'm going to leave in the slides. You can see it. There is no, uh, again, magic rule. Sometimes we have to buy everything because the budget has to be executed now because the donors, because, okay, not a problem. This is just a generic um, 
recommendation. And, and then the training, you also need to define your strategy for training. Is it a training of, it's not training or trainers, you need both, it's training of trainers. Is it an on the job training? Is it that you're gonna call them to a class? You are gonna go waterfall evolving till you reach all your districts? It's, is it going to be a big ban? Nowadays, I should have updated this with the online. Yeah, uh, this is something to configure. And then again, as in the pilot, but now even more important, you need to decide if your system is going to replace the previous system or if they are gonna work in parallel for certain time. Sometimes this is done due to uh, organizations don't trust the new system until they prove data coming out is the same or many reasons. Sometimes we, keep, we need to keep things in parallel for a while and then we have to plan an exit strategy. The same with paper, are you gonna eliminate paper, replicate paper, are you gonna duplicate? All this will shape your decisions and your, and your plan for, for implementing. And I'm gonna quickly move to, to testing. So you do have uh, the slides and the materials. These are the reasons for testing. Why is it important? I think, remember the, the last one. It can be very expensive to figure out that what you are doing is not actually working as you expected in the, in the advanced phases of a project. So it's, it's better to, to find the bad news at the very beginning. Uh, so please start by testing everything. Uh, these are the five phases of testing. I'm not gonna stop in all of them, but this is just to show you how complex testing can be and how important it is it has five phases you need to Review the documentation, review the documentation. You need to plan your testing, allocate time, define your priorities. You need to uh, design your testing. So what are you going to be testing? Ideally, you have the test cases defined so that in every iteration, because of an update, because of a change in the metadata, you test the same actions. Uh, in your app so that you can guarantee that the minimum functionalities are still there. And then uh, you have to execute uh, your, your testing. Ideally, you have a metadata configuration in the, in the case of DHIS2 for that. And you have a matrix to follow up. So here, I'm gonna stop a bit because I want to show you this so that you know you have these links uh, in, the, in the presentation when you download it and you can take these documents. How do we do the testing? This is our, these are our test cycles. We have test cases, we target different versions, but things don't need to be this uh, fancy. You can just use an Excel file with all the things you want to test and then the status and then what happened or who did it. So it can be very simple, but it will really help you uh, be sure that you are ready to go when you are ready to go. And then report. And these are my last slides. Uh, you need to make sure that your bug is reproducible and you need to be specific and informative. If you take, if you follow these two steps, you are gonna be separating facts from speculations. If you are make sure, if you make sure you can reproduce and you specify the bug, for sure you are not saying, I think they should be like that. So dedicate time to step one and two. And when you reproduce a bug, please make sure to report these five, uh, these five. Please, it would really help uh, these five uh, aspects. So we need to know what happened. You can read later this example. What happened in which environment, as, as, as detailed as possible, the steps so that the developer can reproduce, the expected result, what you thought should have happened against what actually happened, and then if you have pictures or videos, screenshots, that always helps a lot knowing what's happening. For the guidelines, I'm gonna describe this tomorrow when we talk about documentation, so I can leave it here. I just, this is this just to, say, to tell you that everything that I have said here super quickly is in this document, but tomorrow I will explore it with you. And that's it. Uh, sorry, Jaime, I went a bit ahead. Or over, sorry, I went a bit over, I went a bit over, but but that's all from me. And I don't know if now we have a break or what is happening. Yes, let's have a break. 
So I, well, I'm not gonna start from the beginning, but let's um, quick thing. I know you're having some issues with the exercises. Sorry, we're working on that, and we'll well, we'll come back to that later. Our session now is gonna be coin mobile devices. We're gonna be collecting some of the things we have been saying the whole week, but especially today. And as you see in the agenda, it says that last till one, but the session is only gonna be 25 minutes because we have this little surprise in the end. That maybe it's not a surprise because it's published in the agenda, but I think it's gonna be quite cool and you're gonna enjoy it. And it will be a nice uh, way to finish this intensive or intense sessions. So Marta, may I ask you to, to share the screen, please? Uh, awkward moments because of video conferences. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks, Marta. So going mobile, last section of going mobile after what we is, have been. Can I say, this is how Jaime makes sure that I listen to all his presentations. Of course. I think what I'm seeing here, you already know, but uh, I like being heard. So session time, 40 minutes, 25 minutes for me talking. Sorry, last time I'm gonna be talking, uh, maybe in the whole academy, so. During this presentation, we're going to be covering, well, what you should know is you should know what to look into while acquiring devices. Marta has been presenting how to scale, so in those terms, but we will go a bit on the specifications. What are the different alternatives while installing the app? This we discussed already on Monday, really briefly. Today, we will go a bit deeper. Uh, every time I've been doing a presentation, I was kind of pushing the, the problem or the answers later. I hope they're arriving. In the morning, I have been answering to some things. Here is one of the other things I promised I would be talking about. The same goes for the MDM. I'm going to explain really quickly what it is, why it might be extremely useful for your implementation. There have been, there, there have been some questions on the Slack channel this morning. I will study MDM, I will explain later. So here we'll come. And I wanna finish with uh, a quick explanation of why putting Android devices in your project might make, might make the server crash when before it was working properly and what to do to prevent so. And at the end, Marta will take the four, 15 minutes. We're going to have an online quiz. This is not an exam, but it's going to be really interesting because we're going to be um, asking and answering some questions in a competition way. Uh, if you pay attention, it's going to be really helpful because maybe some of the questions are going to be in the exam that we'll have tomorrow. So yeah, Marta, thanks. Go to the next slide. Um, so whenever you are acquiring devices, uh, Marta was saying before, uh, and that's what we're going to be focused on mobile phones, tablets, or Chromebooks. I know that in most of the places you're going to be using mobile phones and tablets, but I don't know if Gambia is present here in the room, but I know Gambia has, uh, performed implementation with many Chromebooks on the field. So I'm listing down there the URL where you can find these specifications. This is something that we test and we review kind of once every year. And we, we try to give you an easy way to know if the devices you're gonna be acquiring should match the specifications that we, we, we need for the application. It's impossible to give you more general rules than this. Uh, and more specific than this, because there, every implementation is different, every project is different. So here it's the minimum we think you should need, but this is only the starting uh, point. Afterwards, you should make analysis and say, okay, but you know what? You're telling me that if I'm getting a phone, it should have, for example, I'm going to the RAM memory specifications, one gigabyte, we recommend two or more. Well, more, because in case you're gonna be working with programs that contain 
hundreds or thousands of prone rules as we have been seeing. Having more memory is gonna help. Same for the CPU, etc. So this is something you can find on the link underneath and I will not go deeper into this. Whenever you acquire devices, apart from checking the specifications that were shown in the table before, make sure if it's possible, as Marta was saying, sometimes it will not be because of budget constraints or because of budget execution, but make sure you acquire a small set of devices, you test, listen to this, test, 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 keep testing, and then acquire the rest. It can be really disappointing, as I have seen in some implementations, they have bought 100 devices, they test them, and they're not enough for the implementation. So then they need to buy another 100. So whenever it's possible, make sure you test on the device you're gonna acquire, have the program ready, or all your DHI2 configuration ready, make sure it works, and, and then acquire the rest of the test. I need to mention this here, at the moment, it is mandatory to have devices linked to Google accounts. If you have, or you acquire a device that is not compatible with Google, whenever you install the application and you try to run it, you will see this awful message on the right that you need to enable Google Play services. This is something we're working on to remove this dependency, but at the moment it is not possible because of the, in the previous versions, because of the crash system we use and from the geolocation. Again, we're working on it, but now be careful with your car devices. This was not common in the past, but now because of the fight between Huawei and the US, if you acquire some devices that do not support Google Play services, you might find this awful surprise that your phones will not be compatible. That is the reason, get one or two tests, and once you're sure it's working properly, get the rest. Can you go next? Yeah. This slide should be familiar because it's exactly the same one we saw on the first day when you were getting the app. Many people went a bit ahead and they installed the Google Play app and then they realized they could not take screenshots and they were complaining saying I cannot take. And then we said, yes, because this one is the production and in production, I'm going back to my first session security, we are forbidding taking screenshots because OWASP recommends not to do it. So that's the production one, but you can get it as well from the GitHub. Um, uh, the GitHub releases we, we publish every time there's a release, there you have three different ones. We're not gonna go through them because we did it already, but you know that with the training one is the one you should be using for training purposes or for debugging. And you could also get the application in your own store. This I promise somehow that I will explain. I'm gonna explain later in this session. So you might be wondering, but why do you give me so many options to, to install my application? Well, I'm gonna cover two. So let's divide this in two channels. The first one is the Google Play Store and I'm gonna consider the rest as a whole. So. If you use the Google Play Store, it's uh, it's really, really uh, much easier to manage. I think most of the implementations I have seen or I have visited, they use the Google Play Store. It's really easy to manage. You can log it in your, in your phone, you go to the Play Store, install the HIS2, done, wonderful. Um, uh, however, these are one of the big issues that you have there is that you cannot control when to update and you need Google account on your device. This is what I just explained. But let's go to the first point where it says you cannot control when to update. Later on, we're gonna have, uh, here's Rwanda. Maybe they, they will explain the implementation. They have done a great job, but I know they had a not so nice surprise when we published a new version and some of their devices got updated because of this. Whenever you're using Google Play, you cannot control when do you want your devices to be updated. This means that when we ask that now we're trying to follow um, a release every six months, every time we release, we're gonna put the application to the Play Store. If your devices have been configured to auto update, they will retrieve it. And there's no way you can control this 
in a central way. So you need to go to every specific phone and say, remove the auto updates, and then you will force the user to update, but this cannot be controlled centrally. If we forget about Google Play with this easier to manage, but the difficulties in terms of updates, we go to the other ones. In the other ones, you can control, you could do everything. You could use the GitHub and you could instruct the users how to install, or you could build your own market and then push it whenever you want. So it makes you more in power of when to do it, but it comes with the difficulty added that you need to manage these things. So much on it, please. I've been talking and I've been mentioning in in a Slack channel before, uh, your own market things that is. This is a session that could take one hour to explain. I'm gonna compress it to five minutes. I hope not even. But one of the things we are starting to recommend to every project that decides to implement Android to analyze and maybe use an MDM. So here I'm gonna be making mistakes because I'm gonna be talking about MDM when I should not be because I would, should be mentioning EMM or UMM. But just for the sake of simplicity during the presentation, when I refer to MDM, I'm going to be talking about mobile management and mobile management in the sense that uh, the first one there, mobile device management, which is a piece of software or a platform as is defined in the, in the definition underneath. It's a range of products or services that enables organizations to deploy and support corporate applications. So this is what you should learn from this three, four, five minutes I'm going to be talking is that there is exist, there exists something out there that you could implement that could allow you to set and set up, set up and manage phones remotely. And this, what is the MDM, EMM, UMM, whatever you want to call it. There are differences that we're not going to cover, but that's it. So at one point, if you decide to use something like this, you decide to implement uh, in your project 100 devices, it becomes complicated to manage them manually we could set up an MDM. So Marta, can you go to the next? So it is a type of security software for the administration of mobile devices. And if you ask yourselves, do I need it in which cases? Well, what this allows you, as I said, is to have like a software, a server where you could connect, you could register your devices on this uh, central management console or whatever we want to call it server mdm manager whatever and your devices will become uh managers by this server and this means that you could set policies like the ones we will see in the next slide but uh, you could set policies that your devices are gonna accept and are gonna apply so before in the slack channel i don't know who asked i'm sorry i forgot the name but I'm always saying, so does this mean that we can set a pin code remotely? And I told him or her, no, no, I will explain it. So from all the things we have been seeing before, from the DHIS super perspective, this is not possible. You need to go to the device to set the pin code. But if you go to this way of implementing an MDM, there you could set policies like this one that is force a pin code on the phone. The MDM would allow you to do it. Um, some people will say yes, but you know what happens uh, sometimes in my implementations, I do not own the devices. So we're not talking at ministry level or we're not talking in a big institution that it's providing phones, but the data collectors are using their phones. Well, the MDM, depending on the solution that you will choose, if you go for it, sometimes this is considered as well. And it's what is called bring your own device environments. So there are policies that can be applied to those devices that are less restrictive than the ones you could apply to your own devices. So for example, if someone is using their own device, you don't want to force them specific policies, but if the computer is in the device is owned by someone, uh, by the corporation, you can impose harder measures of policies. Yeah. So, it's really complex, this thing. I have linked there. We have published uh, some months ago an official guide on MDM. I would encourage you to read it quickly. At least give, a, give an overlook in case this is something interesting 
uh, to you. But basically what I think that is mentioned here is that MDM could be, well, there are many features or policies that you could apply, but one of the most interesting ones that most of the MDMs have or which MDMs you should choose in case you're gonna go for one is this one. So from the MDM console, you could impose on your devices to have a screen lock, for example, you could do the APP management. I'm taking what I said on the first day and I've seen previously. So you could push the PHIS2 application whenever you want it. So as from the Android team release version 2.3, you say, I'm sorry, I'm not ready. I need to train my users first. We're still gonna be in 2.2 until I want. So from the MDM console, you could say, okay, now is the time. All my phones, please get the new version. You could also log devices and web information. And going back to the session of security, imagine your device gets lost. We're talking about confidentiality, integrity, availability. With the MDM, you could be able, you should be able to wipe the phone in this from the distance. These are other things I will not cover, but just for you to know, there are things. Check the guideline there that we have that explains this quite in depth. So next one, Marta, please. And I think this is the last slide. Um, here, I wanted to explain why some of you sometimes are disappointed or you have suffered that because of Android, your project has stopped working. And I'm gonna try to explain it, making a simile between a post office um, and what happens with the Android devices. I hope it's gonna be clear. If not, I can answer questions afterwards. But basically, by now, with all this week of training, you should understand and you should know that web and Android work in a different way. So you know that web usually in terms of security is different, in terms of cache values and offline mode is different because it does not exist. But Android, we have learned through the whole week that Android takes information. So you are able to insert data offline and then push it to the server. So going to the simul, imagine we have a post office and we have 10 users. And those users are writing one letter per day. So we're having 10 people writing a letter and every day they go to the post office and they give this letter. So the postman or the post lady every day is receiving 10 letters. And he's efficient and he can take one letter. Okay, he analyzes and say, okay, this is correct. And sends it, okay, this is correct. Mm, okay, the stamp, okay. Sorry. So 10 users, one letter per day, every day we're getting 10 letters, which the post office can cope with. Imagine now that these 10 users, instead of writing the letter every day and taking it to the post office, they are writing the letter, but they are keeping it because they don't want to go to the post office or because they cannot. We don't, we don't care about that. The thing is that these 10 users are keeping their letters till the end of the month. So I'm a user, I'm writing my letter, I keep it day one of January, I keep it second of January. So at the end of the month, I have 30 letters and I'm going with these 30 letters to the post office on the 30th of January. Here you are, take my 30 letters, please make sure they arrive on time. If all the users are doing this, we're going to have the post office on the 30th of December having 300 letters, which most probably the postman or the post lady will not be able to process because it's too much and it will not be enough. This simul is what is happening when you're working with Android and offline mode. So before, when you were using the web, every time you were inserting or creating a patient, this information was being sent to the server, to our post office. With Android, we're collecting information, and at one point we send this information. So the server that was being able to cope with this information that was coming is spread in time. When using Android and Android's pushing the information at the same time, it might make the server overloaded or not being able to cope with all this information to process. So this means that if you have been using 100 users in web, with a specific server, it means, or it might mean that whenever you take those hundred users and they go offline and they start using phones, maybe your server is not enough. And it was enough, but now because of the way we're sending this information in a more bigger chunks 
in maybe at the same period of time, it might mean that the server in this period was correct, but when we make him work so much on this specific time, it cannot. So with this, what you want, what we just wanted to say is that make sure your server is ready for big deployments. We know this is really difficult to measure, but now maybe that you have acquired this concept, at least you should think, okay, hold on, hold on. Maybe I cannot go offline or Android straight away. Let me do a little bit of analysis. Let me check some guidelines. Let me check with the experts to see if it's, um, if it's gonna be able to, to if, it's, if it will be enough or not. I think that's it from my side. Marta, floor is yours. I don't wanna, I don't know if you wanna make an introduction to what's gonna happen now, but all yours. Sure, so, um, so we are gonna make now a quiz about what we have been talking about today. Um, it's not an exam. Uh, it's not gonna evaluate your final grades for, for the course. It's just a, a nice way or a fun way to, um, to review the content because today it was very theoretical. So we thought it would be nice. So what you have to do is to log in to this address, not log in, sorry, to, to go to this address on your mobile device. So take your phone, tablet, or I, I probably also in web, but it's nicer in the phone. And, 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 and put this URL on your browser. And then, am I still sharing? Yes. And then, of course, I have to run the, the whole thing. One second. <laughs> Can we do it as well? Or we're not invited? Um, I mean, facilitators, you are not supposed to do it because you know everything or do it, but choose the wrong answer. So it's not, we don't, uh, we want all of you to participate. You don't need to put your real name, put the name that you want. It's also okay to put your real name. But uh, if you are gonna be like, oh, I'm gonna lose, then put a, a random name. We just want you to participate and be part of it. So let me, let me launch it one sec. Okay. So, I'm just going to make the questions random. Yeah, so we should be ready to go. So that this is the screen you will see. And this is the pin you have to enter. So we are waiting for participants to join. So we have in theory 62 participants in the Zoom session. So I'm expecting the same number there. Twenty two, okay, twenty five and growing. Marta, they're asking the, the, the I'm going to post here the Kahoot because they're asking for the, for the URL. They're asking for the URL. The URL, yes. The, uh, Is uh, well, it was in the presentation. Where is the presentation? Did I close it? Team, I think we have to. Well, we have some facilitators in the group. Welcome. Oh, we lost someone. Please come back. Oh, we're losing people. How oh, come? I think at least 40 45 we need to have. Do you need more time? Thirty-eight. Come on, come on. Seems like we don't get thirty-nine. We have Obi Wan Kenobi. Obi Wan Kenobi. Uh -huh. We 
have Mr. Academy, Manu. We have a TEI. <laughs> okay, I think we have to start. We are not uh, getting more. Bravo, yay, welcome, bravo. I'm gonna start, what do you think, Jaime? Yeah, I think we, we should are not go. getting more, so we have to start. We're even losing people. Okay, let's start before we lose someone else. Okay, welcome deep. Okay, we are 39 again, and now we start. Rock and roll. Done. True or false? Adding mobile devices to my implementation does not add any security implications. Is that true or false? We have nine, ten answers, eleven, fifteen, and growing. Me, this is an me. easy one. Come on. We are thirty-nine. Three seconds. We have twenty seconds per question. You have to be quick. Okay, we need to talk to eight people. It does add security implications, as Jaime said, because you have your data on your device with you, Jaime. You can cry and improve your, your session. So next. Okay, sorry, we have to see. Mr. Academy was the quickest. Okay, go to the next one. This is a quiz. The usability and user friendliness of your configuration is tested during user acceptance test, pilot field testing, internal testing, or monkey testing? Which one? 12 answers, 10 seconds. I know it's quick. I didn't realize that 20 seconds would be this fast. It's the first time I prepared a uh, Kahoot. Yay, the majority have chose the user acceptance test is when we te uh, test our usability. And now we have a TI winning. <laughs> Okay, and we lost Mr. Academy. When acquiring devices, it's always better to buy them all at the beginning to get good discounts. Is this true or false? Ten seconds. This is an easy one. I hope. 36. Okay, almost everyone answered this one. And the answer is false. Okay, some people really are into discounts. That's fine. But no, you if you can, it's better to to paste the 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 the, the chat the 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 bot the the acquiring devices. So we have the TEI still winning, and let's go with a true or false question. Your testing phases are cyclical, and they all inform your server configuration. Is this true or false? 10 seconds. We have 32, 33, 34, 38, 37, sorry. Okay. This is true. You should keep configuring. This was a good result. You should keep configuring your server during all the testing process because that's, that's where you learn. So the TI is really winning. I don't know if later we'll want to, to disclose them. Okay, DHS2 allows for SMS reporting integrated in the Android app, which would be enabled when internet is not available. Is this true or false? Five seconds. Okay, yes, it's true. You need to enable it, etc. But yes, it is available. And oh yeah, yeah, this TI. I hope it's registered in the program. <laughs> Next question. Which of the following secure methods is not available for the DHS to Android app? So when you lose your phone, it will self-destruct in 10 minutes. You can set a pin code. You can restrict access based on server configuration and you can encrypt your database. Which one is not available? Not. Not available. Which one is not available? 
Yes, your phone will not self-destruct. We have not uh, explored that option. So TI is there, but let's focus on the, on the following. So we have Nini, Socorro, BB-8, and a big smile following closely. So question seven, which of the following parameters are not available in the Android settings web app? The number of reserved values, the maximum number of case events that are to download, the DB encryption, or the number of users that can sync to the server at the same time? Five seconds. We have almost all answers. Exactly, you cannot control the number of users syncing at the same time. So you need to really uh, pay attention to the to the resources of your server. Oh, and we have BB-8, oh. I don't know how to read that. Uh, taking the lead position and our big smile following closely. So quiz, which one of the following concepts is not about security? integrity, reliability, confidentiality, or availability. So which one Jaime did not talk about today? Guys, please. Very answers. 100%. Five seconds. Don't fail on me. OK, <laughs> that was a good one, Jaime. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, well, it's OK. Eh? Seven people were not listening to me. No, but the. Uh, they they chose okay we can it it's it's availability no I know it's reliability true true Marta you I were not this. listening out yes but out. I did <laughs> sorry okay uh, I hope that's not recording <laughs> the information needs to be authentic it needs to arrive to the destination exactly as it was sent at origin what is this description referring to integrity, confidentiality, reliability, or availability. Information needs to be the same when it is sent and when it arrives. Yes, that's uh. integrity. And that's kind of a fair result, Jaime. Let's see our top five, BB-8 is there, but the TI is coming back. So Corro always. Almost there. What is a bad or the worst option from the presented pattern for auto-generated IDs when you work offline? What is the less good? And I'm not gonna read the options. I let you look at them, but this should have been maybe even more time. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Four, three, two, one. This was a bit difficult, huh? oh. even reading the options. No, I think this one should not be considered. But OK, TDMX is fighting for the winning position. Next one. The testing process has the following stages. I let you read. Getting nervous. There were five, five. So yeah, but I was very fast on this part. So I understand. And our, our big smile gaining positions. What are the testing on your pilot? What are you testing on your pilot of field testing? Sorry. Your SOPs? your server in the app, your system configuration. What are you testing on your pilot? Did I press? Okay, even, 11, 11, 11. You're testing your workflows and, and how they integrate the, the technology with your SOPs on real life work. And BB-8, is back in the next in the first position, followed by Socorro. True or false? The DHS to Android app only downloads the changes in my configuration when I sync metadata. Only the changes or everything. 
just in case something changed. It's an easy one, eh? Can't hear you with the music. It's false. It downloads and refreshes all your configuration. So Nini <laughs> and Sergio make their first appearance. And let's we have two more questions, three more questions. It's always recommended to distribute my Android app with Google Play because I have full control of the upgrade process. Is this true or false? Thirty-six answers. I think we have every. Ah, yeah, we have thirty-eight. I think. Okay, one second. Yes, now we are all. It's false. That's the main problem of Google Play. Yes, very good. In. Okay, TDMX is back in action. Quiz. Yes, to the last question. If I want to manage my devices in the field, the minimum solution I could adopt is an MDM. UME, EMM, UMM. This is going to be hard. Yay, very good. MDM. Let's go to the next one. Well, what happens here? The TI is back in the last question, wanting to get control again. And the last one, in which testing are you testing your configuration and the Android app? very good in your internal testing this one was very good so let's check our final winners dun, dun, dun. number three is sergio. sergio congratulations sergio number two is socorro congratulations and number one -na 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 barbecue ah, barbecue barbecue <laughs> so and tdmx and monkey oh um we're number four and five. Identify yourself in the channel if you <laughs> if you want us to. I don't know. Thank you for being paying attention. Uh, I'm gonna well, stop sharing. Uh, Thank always. you very much for participating. Thank you very much for joining uh, or staying, even though we were using the break. So Alice, how can I stop this? Sorry, sorry. <laughs>